It is good to be back tonight. It is great to see everyone here. Uh, so thankful for your presence and your fellowship. I uh, enjoy very much uh, spending time with you. I was uh, telling a few folks today, uh, this evening, that it was, it was after 1.30 before everybody cleared out today. I stood at the door after we dismissed and probably stood there for two or three minutes before the first person even came out. Folks were chatting and visiting and just enjoying each other's company, and it was uh, it's a very beautiful thing to behold. When, uh, when yeah, that's right. Oh, that's why. Okay, it was raining out there. And I was the dummy standing out in the rain, so, okay. All right, I'm glad we cleared that up. Thank you, Brother Fred. All right, next, next week I'll be preaching on decorum during the, the lesson, and uh, <laughs> just, just teasing. Um, we have uh, uh, a different lesson this evening than, than what I normally preach, but I like to do these every so often. Uh, they they kind of keep me on my toes and, and kind of break up the monotony, so to speak. Uh, but this is more of a topical lesson tonight uh, than I normally preach, so uh, I hope that it will prove to be beneficial to you. Would you pray with me, please? Thank you, Father, so much for the blessings of this beautiful Lord's Day. We thank you so much for loving us, for providing for us, and for allowing us the opportunity to worship you in spirit and truth. As we look into some more portions of your word tonight, Father, we ask you to bless us and help us, Father, with our understanding, help us to be convicted, and help us, Father, to be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, most of us are familiar with this particular saying. There are only two things in this life that are for sure. What are those two things? Death and taxes. That's yes, the only two things that are sure in this life. And, you know, we, we, we even appreciate our politicians that decide to uh, tax us even after we're dead. And so, you know, they, they found a way to take care of that even after we're gone. So, um, But I'm going to talk to you about five certainties in life. Not directly related to this, but one of the items does, in fact, match up with this. We're going to be going through several uh, verses this evening. The first certainty of life is that life is short. It is something that when you're younger, you don't understand. And as you get older, things go by so much quicker. In Psalm 39, in verse 5, David writes, Indeed, you have made my days as a handbreadth, and my age as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor. A handbreadth is a measurement of the pinky to the thumb. And that's, that's what David says our life is. It's that short. And then he says, we're, we're nothing but a vapor. James makes a very similar application in James chapter 4. And we must wonder, I mean, I know God's behind both of these writings, but you've got to wonder if this wasn't, that uh, Psalm 39 wasn't, pushing into James's memory as he is writing this letter. James 4, 13 and 14. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We were... Joking a few moments ago, and uh, David Sergeant was uh, sharing with me some of his wisdom, and uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, which, which, he said, uh, which side of the plane does the pilot sit on? And I, I just heard left back there in the back, and he said, no, on the inside. <laughs> and uh, and he said, unless it's one of those older planes, well. Um, I had a cousin named David, for whom our son is uh, partly named. 
and he was the same age as my mom. They grew up together, and they were playmates going all the way through. His mother and my mom's mother were sisters, and he was, uh, he was a college professor. He, was, he taught history. Uh, he was very adventuresome. Uh, it was because of him, partly, that I gained my love of motorcycles because he always had a motorcycle as long as I can remember, and when we were old enough to sit on the back and put a helmet on, he would take us for a little ride around the block, you know. Uh, David was also a pilot. He flew small planes. And he was at the airport one day, and a, a friend of his had uh, a biplane. And it had two seats, front and back. And his, he normally would not fly with this guy. But the guy had done some work on the plane, and he wanted to go up and, and do a test flight and come back. And, and so David agreed to get in the plane with him. And this guy had had a motorcycle crash uh, in the past and had several fusions in his leg. And the back seat had more leg space than the front seat, so he was flying it from the rear. And David gets into the front. And they're flying, and, and they're going around, and, and they're just a few hundred feet off the ground, and uh, the pilot sees somebody that he knows down on the road, and he decided to go flying over the top of them. And when he did, and he went to pull up, the plane stalled and went straight into the ground, and it killed my cousin David. He was 36 years old. Had his whole life ahead of him. Or did he? Life is short. We just don't know. We don't know. And even when you talk to some of our sisters that are here tonight that have um, advanced themselves into their uh, 90th or years and beyond, they will probably look back across those years and tell you how quickly life has flown by. Life is short. The second certainty of life is that death is sure. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. 14 through 16. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And in its place remembers it no more. It sounds very fatalistic, but it's actually uh, an encouragement to maintain a proper relationship with God and stay close to Him because we know that death is at our door at any moment. It is coming. And having that right relationship with our Heavenly Father will make all of the difference. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Our great-great-great-grandfather Adam and our great-great-great-grandmother Eve, he formed them out of the dust of the ground. Borrowed a rib from Adam to form Eve. My mother was cremated when, when she passed away. And the, uh, the amount of what was left on the cremation was about a little bit larger than a softball. Dust. So it was left. And most of it was just the powder of the bones. You know, we're, we're dust. Our, when we die, our body... Now, we found chemicals to, to keep our body around a little bit longer. But eventually, you know, we're just holding off the inevitable because our body's going to return to dust. Because that's, that's what we are. We were formed from the dust. In Hebrews chapter, 27, or, uh, chapter 9, verse 27, and the first part of verse 28, the Hebrew writer reminds us, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. You know, there are religions in the world, uh, Hinduism in particular, that believes in reincarnation. And a as you study the uh, this situation that they set their mind to, 
if you are a bad person, you are reincarnated as something worse than you were when you were here. And if you're a good person, you'll be reincarnated as something better than what you were. One of my main contacts in uh, Guyana, he, uh, he's East Indian descent. He's married to an Amer Indian in the interior, and they have a little daughter. And he provides a lot of our transportation in the interior. He was not raised as a Christian. His uh, mother was a Muslim, and his father was a Hindu. So he comes from a very different background than most of us are familiar with. And I've talked to him about his, his Hindu roots in particular. And he said, yes, he says, when uh, an uncle or an aunt or, or a close family member would die, that we would sprinkle powder outside the front door when we go to bed at night. And whatever the footprints were that came across that the next day, that's what our uh, relative had come back as. Reincarnation, and it's just something that happens over and over and over again. But yet, the Bible teaches us it is appointed for man to die once. We get one shot at this. And that's it. And it's done. Life is short. Death is sure. Thirdly, there's a day of judgment that's coming. And there's a lot of people that live, even within the church, living as if there's not a day of judgment that is coming our way. And we would do well to be reminded of that from time to time. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, Apostle Paul reminds us, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or good or bad we are we like to set up our own terms of good and bad don't we and when you when you read this you need to bear in mind these are God's words not our words the good those are the people who clothe themselves in Christ and live faithful to Christ the bad are, that's everyone else and it's not about standing in a long line and then having to be reminded of all the things that you did and give an account of those things necessarily. But we're either going to go to judgment clothed in Christ or we're going to be laid bare. In John chapter 5, 26 and through 29, Jesus instructs us for as the father has life in himself so he has granted this, the son to have life in himself and he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life those who have done evil to the resurrection of life of condemnation there are two destinations following the judgment and we need to focus in on the fact that we are going to be judged for the life that we have lived now if it is based upon what you have done and just what you have done we are all condemned because there's none righteous, no, not one. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us can earn our way to heaven. You can't do enough good deeds. You can't feed enough homeless. You can't do enough of anything. You can't attend enough worship services. None of that will save you. Being clothed in Christ and being faithful to him, that's what saves us. And that's why we do feed the homeless. That's why we do worship together. That's why we do the things that we do, such as good deeds, because of the overwhelming good that has been done for us by our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. But there's a judgment day that's coming. I have heard in my life, I have heard so many horrible things that people say with regard to judgment. 
Now, when I get there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let God have it. When I get there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell him what for. You know, I'm, when I get there, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I hate to break this to you, but when you get there, it's not, that's not the scene that's going to play out. When you get there, you're either going to be covered in Christ or you're not. When you look at Philippians chapter 2, it tells us that every, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, that right there tells you a little something about what judgment's going to be like. Because you can bow the knee to him here. Or you will be forced to bow the knee to him there as you're told to depart. What was the old commercial? You can pay me now or you can pay me later. It's, it, it is, judgment is something that is sobering. And it should be a sobering thing for us. Life is short. Death is sure. And there is a day of judgment that is coming. Number four, there is a hell to shun. In Matthew 25, verse 41, as Jesus is speaking to us about the, the shepherd separating the sheep from the goats, the, the sheep, he has said, enter in, you blessed of my father, for I was uh, hungry and you fed me, I was naked and you clothed me, I was sick, you came to me. He lists all of those things, and the sheep, uh, as they are designated, say, when did we see you like this? He says, whatever you did for the least of these, my brethren, you did also for me. And then he turns to the goats. Verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was not prepared for people. That's a concept that a lot of people don't, don't fully grasp. You see, Satan and his angels were created by God like all of the angels together. And they were all perfect, but they were creatures that had free will. And in the very presence of God Almighty, Satan rebelled against God. And a certain number of these angels sided with Satan and were cast out. Hell was prepared for them. But human beings who reject Jesus Christ and reject their Heavenly Father will also find themselves there. Now, when you think about hell being a place that was prepared for Satan and his angels who were in the presence of God but chose to rebel, it's probably not a very nice place. Our, mart our modern concept of hell has been impacted greatly by mass media. Cartoons, uh, drawings, movies, You remember uh, George Burns? Got to live to be, what, like 185? You remember a series of movies that he did about God? Do you remember what the second one was? Oh, God, you devil. And he played the part of God, and he played the part of the devil as if they were equal opponents against each other. That's not it. He's a created being. Satan is more powerful than you can ever imagine. But he's still a created being. He's not as powerful as God. He's not as powerful as God. He's not getting out of this thing. And we can take comfort in that. But we need to get our minds off of the uh, idea that he's walking around with a, a pointed tail and horns on his head and a pitchfork. And he keeps going over here and cutting up the thermostat to make it hotter. Folks, that's not hell. He's not wearing a red suit sitting on our shoulder over here trying to tempt us into doing something. 
Mark chapter 9, verses 47 and 48. Jesus says, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than, to having, than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That quotation there from Isaiah chapter 66 reminded those in Jerusalem of the garbage heap that was outside the city where there would be dead carcasses of animals and there was a trash heap and there were fires that burned constantly and the stench would have been overwhelming and when you would go out there there were always you know dogs or, or other animals that were there the carcasses and if you've ever been around dead carcasses, you know that what happens is the worms, the maggots, take over and they accelerate the decomposition and the getting rid of the body there. And the idea planted in people's mind from this particular verse during that day and time, the word hell is Gehenna in the Greek language. And that's what they called the garbage dump outside Jerusalem. And he was trying to get people to recognize that out there. We, we, we all know how bad that, that garbage dump is and that the fire never dies and there's always worms consuming flesh out there. But hell's going to be so much worse than that. That, that. that right there doesn't even touch what we're going to be contending with. In Matthew 13, beginning in verse 37, Jesus uh, explains the parable of the tares, which he has told previously in this chapter. Matthew 13, 37 through 42. And he answered and said to them, He who sows is the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather together out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is, is a certain reality. And we, and I'm speaking collectively, not necessarily those who are in this room, but we have downplayed hell to the point and, and downplayed God's holiness to the point that uh, we only think there's going to be three people in hell. Who, whoever the, the, the three people political leaders are that you hate the most they're the ones that are going to hell everybody else is going to heaven you know and it's not that way that is not a truth that is a lie and it is a lie from satan in order to cause people to take comfort in their circumstances rather than for them to move to repent life is short death is sure there's a day of judgment. There's a hell to shun. But praise God, there's a heaven to gain. There's a heaven to gain. John 14. From my vantage point, the most comforting passage from the words of Christ. Let me set the stage for you for just a moment. Jesus came into the city earlier that week to an amazing reception. Hosanna in the highest. And as he's there in the city, he overturns tables in the temple and he runs out the money changers. He cleanses the temple. The religious leaders are just fed up with him. 
Jesus knows his end is at the end of this week. And he sets up and arranges for he and his disciples to enjoy the Passover meal together. And at that Passover meal, he, he disrobes and he ties a towel around his waist and he goes around and he washes the feet of his disciples. And then he says, one of you will betray me. It is the one that will dip bread with me. And of course, Judas is the one who dipped bread with him. And he looked at Judas and he said, what you do, do quickly. Go do your business. Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus had just washed the feet of his betrayer. And the disciples are disrupted in their, in their mind because they were celebrating. They had seen this great parade coming in, as it were, of Jesus on the donkey and the people laying down the palm uh, leaves and throwing down their coats and shouting, Hosanna in the highest. And they were thinking, this is it. We're finally going to have Jesus finish this thing. And they were right that he was going to finish the thing, but not the way they thought he would. And they said, well, who's going to betray you? Who's going to betray you? And, and he says, the one who dips bread. And then he says, you know, tonight you will all run away. You will all leave me. And their hearts dropped another notch. And Peter goes, I'll... I'll never, I'll never leave you. I'll die before I do that. And Jesus says, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Where I'm going, you can't go. And they went from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. I wondered for many years, because that chapter 14 heading sits right there. I wondered why he says, let not your hearts be troubled. And then I remembered there was a chapter 13. That's why their hearts were troubled. And Jesus had to go away because he could not go and prepare our dwelling place by remaining here. And if he did not go away, he could not come again and, and receive us to himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We can't imagine it, but we get a glimpse of, in language that we can understand as to how magnificent our future is. In Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5, And he showed me a pure river of water of, water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever what a beautiful idea it's presented to us in the scripture the exact opposite 
of a place where the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. It is a place of peace, a place of comfort, of rejuvenation, of joy. We're never going to get tired. You ever get tired? You ever get so tired you just sit down and you can't get back up? You ever get really hungry? You'll never be hungry ever again. Have you ever been so dry and thirsty that you would do anything for a drink of water? I think there's a few of us here that have been there before. You're never going to get thirsty again. Are you in pain? Well, the older we get, we get pains in places we never knew we had. You will experience no more pain. You ever weep out of sorrow? More than I care to admit. There'll be no more tears in heaven. Former tears. Will have passed away. Life is short. Death is certain. There is a day of judgment. There is a hell to shine. And there is a heaven to gain. Those are the five certainties of life. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 30. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Knowing these five certainties of life, there's no reason for us to be worried. The only thing we need to concern ourselves with is being faithful to God. That's it. Being faithful to God. All these other things are going to take care of themselves. And one day, whether it's tonight, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, 40 years from now, whenever it is that the Lord calls you home, you'll be prepared. And you'll be comforted and thankful that Christ went and prepared a place for you. These truths are things sometimes we like to not pay attention to. Recognizing our own mortality is something that is, is a sobering moment in our lives. And sometimes it takes the death of someone close to us to finally realize that we're not going to live forever in this life. We like to put away uncomfortable and, and unpleasant thoughts and set those things aside. And just think about good things. And, and there's, there's something good to that. But we also need to be reminded that there are bad things. And whether that serves to be a motivation to you to avoid those bad things or a reminder to you that you made the right decision long ago to follow after Christ, however that works, praise God for it. We, we have a, a short life. It's brief. It's a mist, it's a fog, it's a vapor. Let's make the most of it. Commit your life to Christ tonight or recommit your life to Christ. If you're not a child of God, having put on Jesus in baptism, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? 
Are you willing to confess the deity of Christ and confessing that Jesus is the Son of God? Are you willing to turn from the sins for which Jesus died, those sins that have condemned you for eternity? And that there's nothing you can do in and of yourself to undo those sins? Are you willing to turn away from those and turn to the cross, embrace the sacrifice of Christ? And will you tonight humbly submit to being buried in water that is baptized for the remission of your sins and be raised to walk in a new life, a forgiven life, a life whereby you are clothed in Christ to walk in a new life and you can now look forward to that heavenly home? those of you who've done those things. Maybe your commitment has waned. Maybe it's been strengthened. But whatever your commitment level is, recommit yourself to Him. Understanding that God has spared us to this moment and those five certainties are still in the future for us. And hopefully, prayerfully, I want to encourage you to avoid one of those certainties. Because number four ought to be marked off your list. And just skip straight to five. What is your need tonight? Our brothers prepared a song for us. Whatever your need is, whether a need for prayer, recommitment, whether you need to commit yourself for the first time, whatever it may be, Won't you let us help you tonight? Won't you come forward as together we stand and sing?